Bismillah rahman rahim We are here on episode 3 of The Mo Show. And I got her, I got her, one of my favorite friends of all time. This is uh, Miss Raha Maharag. Hello. Can I just give uh, my viewers a quick introduction <laughs> on who you are and what you do and why you're here? And then I will introduce how, how why I'm laughing and yep. I'm smiling and yep. I'm really excited about this. Um, it's, it's honestly a, a privilege and a great pleasure to have uh, Raha on the show. Raha is the youngest Arab and first female Saudi to ever summit Everest. And um, I remember when I, like, I, I asked him, like, oh my God, Raha, you summited Everest. You're like, it wasn't the hardest mountain. <laughs> I was like, that are you kidding? Across, <laughs> I'm talking about mountains on Earth. Uh, I don't know about any other mountains and other planets that you're talking about, but Everest, as far as I'm concerned, is the, the most challenging, is it not? Mm, it's the... Okay, it's the highest mountain in the world. Yep. It's the one with all the glory. It's not the hardest. Not uh, the hardest. Not even by a long shot. Yani, they say all all old timers in, in mountain, the mountaineering com- community say the second highest peak in each continent is probably the most difficult. Mm-hmm. Because you have Annapurna is second highest, I think, and other other second highest. So height doesn't necessarily make it the most difficult. Okay. Height makes it most maybe complex because it's just so big and it takes a long time to get there. Mm-hmm. But it's not the di- most difficult one. And even in even in my short climbing career, it's not the most difficult one at all. And I hate saying that because I sound like I'm being arrogant. But the, the truth is, Everest is one of the most... Um, assisted mountains out there what does that mean okay so there are assisted mountains and non-assist mountains Mm -hmm. so there are mountains where you climb up and you have an assisted team a team that helps you carry your food your gear your tent and you pretty much need to just climb from point a to point b with the essentials on your back which makes the backpack pretty light not non-assist mountains are the monsters so yani imagine needing to carry all your gear your tent, your food, your fuel, and your clothes on your back. So basically you carry something like 25, 30 kilos on your back, and then maybe 15, 20 kilos on your sled, day one, and then as you eat and as you consume fuel, that, that weight uh, decreases, yeah. but it decreases from the sled and it goes on your back. Mm-hmm. Right? If, like, yeah. as, as it gets more and more steep, then you can't use the sled. It's going to pull you. Mm-hmm. So you have to put the, the weight of the sled in your backpack. So you're carrying around 25, 30 kilos. Wow. And then at that time in my life, I was maybe four or five kilos more than now, maybe 64, 65. Muscle? Yeah, muscle and fat as well. You need to, you need to go into the mountain with fat to burn. Mm. You okay. need to. And I was never a fatty person, yeah. so I needed to put on weight, uh, which was fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You were always uh, in shape. You are always the volleyballer. The uh, you know the girl that was uh, you know playing the playing girl that should have been a guy yeah the only the only girl in a group of guys playing volleyball on the beach or, or soccer or whatever yeah. it was I definitely want to get into the training that went into uh, okay. into all of that but if you were to rank the the three toughest mountains in the world uh, if I was to say Denali at one would would you agree so the I w- okay the, the toughest mountains that I have climbed and the def- toughest mountain that I think are the toughest mountains you didn't climb them all I did but there are mountains that aren't on my list that are tougher oh. so I'm going to tell you the toughest mountains that I have climbed out of first hand experience Denali is number one two and three. <laughs> oh my god yeah for many reasons for me personally yeah. Denali was a disaster okay and for many other people as well. Yeah. It's a tough mountain for many reasons. It's The terrain is difficult. The weather is really moody. It's very cold. The culture on the mountain is very harsh. Mm. I, I've seen terrible things on the mountain. Like mm-hmm. someone was in really bad shape and then someone says, well, what did you think? This is Titan Denali. Like mm-hmm. what? This is the mentality. Like mm-hmm. you suffer on the mountain. In addition to uh, the, the 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 type of ice terrain, it's yeah. just tough. It's and, and it's a non-assist, so you need to carry a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was getting to the point where I could book like a new. 25 kilos on your back and then maybe 10 15 on your sled depending on the day and then i was uh, 60 something kilos including eight kilos of rope and water so you're hauling ass and you're not walking around in Kurnish. Yeah, yeah. you're carrying that yeah. in boots in incline <laughs> that's unbelievable I, I realized that the mountain was no joke when uh the the, the most extreme person i know and arguably one of the toughest uh, person that, that that I know, Muhammad Zahid, went to Shout Denali. Out to Shout out to Muhammad Zahid, absolutely. He's he's a machine, mashallah. mashallah Now this guy wakes up at, at 4 a.m. and he's yeah. in bed by 8 p.m. 
and he's just so militant in his yeah. ways all right nobody can compete at his pace it's incredible yeah. uh, me and him have the same trainer and 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 i pick my trainer's brain on him I'm like what's he like in the gym he's like he is a, a personified animal okay point is he went to denali yeah. all right and for whatever reason i know he has an altitude issue yeah he, he uh, also got sick someone got yeah, sick as well yeah there was well, he pulled out of it two years ago i think it was they were scheduled to go back this the May. same year i was there 22 2018 the same year yes yeah yeah, yeah. I, I was i got there a week after they left or, okay. or i got there when they were leaving <laughs> yeah 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 it brings back <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 we were on the same like that's crazy that's crazy i, I remember I two years ago thinking like the, the only four or five crazy saudis are there in the same time <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they must think we're really adventurous yeah. until they find out that those are the only five <laughs> the saudi mountains. Yes. <laughs> maybe six maybe yeah, five six <laughs> max. um so so yeah he for whatever reason pulled out and they were scheduled to go back this may but then yeah. corona yeah. happened yeah. and then they had to pull out corona um <clears throat> Where, so when did it all start? Last time, I mean, the first time I met you, you know, 2005, oh uh, you were you were uh, finishing up school in the UAE. You were working, if I am not mistaken, in an advertising a- agency. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the first, actually, we met when I was in college. Yeah. Pajama. Yeah, yeah. We met. I was like 18 or something. Yeah. Um, Graduated and then you went to advertising. Right? Yeah, I, I started actually. Wor- I started at Leo Burnett even before I graduated. I started at Leo because uh, I was so excited to work at Leo Burnett. I actually went up to the Leo building, knocked on the door and said, hi, can I meet the head creative? I want to give my CV and I didn't, I didn't finish college yet. So I did and that impressed him and they gave me a, 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 I was an intern, I think the longest intern they had mm. and then they hired me. So I worked at Leo Burnett for a long time. A um, couple of years? Yeah. Four years? Five. Yeah, four or five years. Yeah. Um, which is a long time, but, yeah, I mean, bef- Absolutely, yeah. before, time. yeah, before leaving. It's, it's, yeah. And, and and decide, like I said, you know, quick turnover nowadays. But so then, how do you go from from, <laughs> from that? How do you go from that to living? You, you moved back to Saudi yeah. with with brother Mo. Uh, Muhammad. No, here's the thing. Muhammad, uh, who is, by the way, for people who don't know, guest one mm-hmm. of the Mo show. Yeah. Awesome, awesome person just don't tell him i said that you know? <laughs> i'll make sure he doesn't get the feed for this uh for this now, Muhammad is an incredible brother uh we lived uh, actually me my brother and my sister all were in Sharjah together my si- my eldest sister iman shout out to iman left and then uh, me and Muhammad were a year apart so we, we stayed and then Muhammad decided to go to spain to do his masters and then that's when like the reality yeah came knocking at the door and you know, I'm a young girl living on my own in Dubai. It's not, you know, no. that said it's time to bring. Yeah. That's that said is like, yeah, it's time to come back. Yep. And that's, I think when everything, the gears kicked in, like the panic mm-hmm. of realizing that this, I, I don't like that. I, I, I didn't like that. I was told I had to quit my, this job. And then I didn't like that. I didn't like that. It was like time. I didn't see it. I didn't get the point. Because you're too free spirited for exactly. that. Exactly. And I, I and they're like, yeah, okay. And of course, like the the big M word, you know, we need to get married mm. came up and everybody was like, panic, you, you know. You just kept deflecting. You know, those me, me, middle marriage. mid twenties exactly. <laughs> mid twenties panic. Yeah. Out of this typical thing. Yeah. And the more I felt the pressure, the more I was like, Are you still getting that? I mean, or have okay, you passed so, the point? Wait, let of, me let me get to the that and then I'll explain. Yeah, okay. Because yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a doozy. Okay, so <clears throat> we got to the point where uh, I had to come back. During that time, when I was writing my my resignation letter, I decided to do something crazy. That was mine. That was just for me. I didn't know what it was. I had no idea how to find this thing until um, randomly. I went online, I checked, I was checking for, you know, adventures, you know, stuff to do. I didn't find it. I wanted something to basically piss my parents off um, and prove that, you know, I just like, picked my you life, right? Do it, yeah. yeah. Uh, randomly, one day, a girl, we were sitting, a group of people, like random people. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, sitting yeah, down, yeah. there was this. Uh, Lovely lady, uh, Rowan. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, Rowan. I haven't seen her in a few years, but yeah, she was sitting down talking about her Eid trip coming up. And she's like, I'm going to go climb a mountain in Africa. I'm go- it's called Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro. Yeah. And no joke. I was like, Isn't that a fruit? No joke. I, I, I completely, <laughs> I had no idea. I thought it was some kind of fruit. And um, I loved that idea of, you know, going, first of all, I love travel. Mm-hmm. And I love cultures, and I love these things, and 
adventure and sports. So this is like tick, 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 tick. You live on the mountain? I asked her, like, you, you literally? She's like, yeah, it's company pay and we take you. And I'm like... <laughs> Light bulb moment for you. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I decided that this is what I wanted to do. And uh, I never imagined that something like that would ever open such incredible doors. Yeah, I never imagined that that one act of like defiance would, you know, change my life that way and, and my parents my dad was like I am telling you marriage and you're saying mountains my dad's just <laughs> my, ja- my dad was just like haram baba anyone that knows my dad's yeah. like he's the sweetest but sweetest. He, I think he had like you know he, probably he, yeah. he was yeah, just yeah. like yeah why are, you, why are you doing this to me <laughs> be normal he's like w- why he, yeah. he, he initially said no initially, well, well it's it's outlandish of that, course. the thought of going out into the middle of and, nowhere and remember this is like a couple of years ago before it became cool for yeah. people to go and do yeah. these things and it's like become more acceptable yeah so I, I was like yeah this is what I wanted to do and that's when this whole thing just exploded like I I fell in love with mountaineering and I found su- such pride in being able to, to, to pick the path I wanted mm-hmm. and not uh, follow the typical mundane kind. And, and, and I'm not dissing anyone that did. If that's what you wanted, then that's incredible. Mm-hmm. And my mom always says, uh, Erha, explain that you are not against getting married. I am not against getting married, people. Because mm-hmm. I get this a lot. I'm not. I just, you're, you're just into something else right I, now. I just simply believe that when it's the right time, yeah. It's the right time, no matter you're on top of the mountain or yeah. in the city. What is meant for you will co- will go, will come for you. You need to continue to keep moving and you need to continue to, to evolve. evolve and to, to have that hunger to live your life for yourself. And nobody should tell you And no one ready. should tell you because you can't. It's not something that you suddenly go ding like a toaster. O- only you will know when you're ready. And sometimes even you don't because sometimes it just happens because they may go to sleep. Absolutely. Know, just, you know, sometimes yeah. it just happens. Unexpected. 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 Yeah, Unexpected. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not against it. I just felt like during that specific period of my life, I wasn't ready for that like pressure of, you know, coming back or mm. I, and anyone that knows me, I'm, I'm not the most comfortable in the typical setting, like call, typical circle of uh, our society. I'm not comfortable putting on, I love getting dressed. I love, I love wearing dresses in my own terms. I'm not comfortable putting it on, going to a wedding, sitting down and having people gawk at me. I'm not, yeah. I'm not comfortable with yeah, that at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. So that was like one of the main catalysts was, um, that age that every single woman hits mm. and I, I, I feel for every single I would okay person because maybe men have a more, more leeway but we all go through it we all go through that pressure of societal expectations of you know by this age you know you gotta everyone, be, you gotta be yeah. there and it's preposterous because you know your life is your own you get one and you you know you you can't force what's not meant for you and you can't wait for things that are not are not uh yeah. so yeah it, it was such a crazy roller coaster for me to get to where i wanted to go which is be a, an adventure yeah. traveler so then you just banged out seven seven mountains seven <laughs> so, peaks so i just i came back from kili and it changed my life. Easy? I mean, was that just a stroll in the park? Um, look, I, I've always been athletic, so that really helped my background. Yeah. Kili is not an easy one. You can't say it's easy because you do get altitude. And it's like super steep parts? Yeah, you get hit by, you get altitude. Uh, you get hammered by altitude. What in is that in meters? Uh, or feet? How do you work? 5,000 meters? Yeah. Did you do any training on a local level? G- Gebel. So this is Kili. Kili, I had like zero you to 100. You went there just yeah. fresh. Yeah. And then um, I learned I, the hard way that there's layering. There's way to, the way to, to keep your ha- hands warm. Because people like me who have bad circulation mm-hmm. and your nose, you can lose your nose and your fingers and your, the tips of your ears. Um, I learned and I taught myself. So in the beginning, uh, it was like, driving blind and then when I came back from Kili I was like okay I'm going to teach myself how to do these things and these skills and I was in Jeddah at the time خلاص. I had moved back from Dubai فتخيل, فتخيل, like wanting to so I remember uh, Muhammad was in Spain Iman was in Riyadh and I was alone in my parents house my new boots came and they are triple la sportivas high altitude Olympus Mons my goodness yeah they're up to your knees they're yellow and black 
you walk like a penguin and it's like dig, dig, dig. They, it's unnatural. Unnatural. Yeah. I had to break those in in Saudi because it was Ramadan. Right after Ramadan, I had to go. In Hayr Rauda or did you go to Jabal Souda? Had back then, you couldn't even go to Jabal Souda because it was like not as well as, yeah. a, 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 invested in. Invested in as now. So I would wear it around the house, and my mom would be like, "Kan Ramadan." I would wear like a skirt and that, and everyone would be looking at me like. And then I would actually wear it to the mall. I would wear a abaya and I would put them on because it's so hot. You have to break them in. You have to break them in because you might get blisters. And That's I'm walking around with like, Duk. yeah. I'm sure they thought, yeah, Latif, I had a problem or something. Yeah, yeah. And then all the looks in the gym here, Ayama, it, it was just the beginning of. I'm so, I'm so proud to say that women's sports and women's athleticism and women's uh, mark in the sports world in the Saudi community and off. the Gulf yeah. has changed. Are we, Saudi women allowed to compete in the Olympics today? Of course. That's uh, yes. That's allowed. Well, you have to you're, you have to have an Olympic committee for the sport okay. for you to be <clears throat> eligible to go because you go through your Olympic committee. So not all sports yet have Olympic committees or have committees okay. not yet mm-hmm. but we're slowly getting we're slowly, we are we're yeah slowly Ho- getting horseback there. riding was one of the first and i think we, we uh, were actually we got a first or second medal or or we finished it was uh, we got I, a medal in that in, in, in london in london we had equestrian we had judo we had a fencer and track and field okay i think these were the four and then we had more things i think in the last one i can't mm-hmm. uh, shame on me for not knowing but I remember I watched every single one of them. Uh, it's changed. Yeah. It's changed. So back then, تخيل, تخيل, like imagine back then I had to like break them in and then I had to ask the driver to take me far, far away. So it was hilarious. And I didn't have, like, I, I had just left my job. I didn't have like the budget to, to, to train with like fancy things. No one wanted to train me anyway. Mm. <laughs> so all I had was uh, my, my smaller boots, not the Olympus Mons, my half boots. My backpack and uh, you know those wares that you use to scales, yeah, yeah. to scale bags before yeah. going. I had that okay. and a and a garbage bag, and I would put in the the sand, and every week I'd add five kilos. That's that's what I used to to climb to, to train to, to, strengthen, to your strengthen your core your and core and conditioning because you need to condition wow. as well putting on the backpack yeah. and your shoulders. You need yeah. to condition your knees. You need to condition. Yeah. No problem finding sand. No, not that, that. Alhamdulillah, that was abundant. <laughs> ready, ready uh, and also, uh, <coughs> heat is a kind of conditioning as well. Okay. It's not the same as cold, but mm. being uncomfortable. Oh my God, absolutely. Being uncomfortable yeah. is a type of conditioning yeah, yeah. because sweating, getting sweating, and then getting like skin rashes and mm-hmm. skin aggra- being aggravated from the sweat is part of conditioning because you get yeah. similar things in ice climate, yeah. just different reasons mm. so instead of feeling the heat is hot on your face you feel the cold is hot so it's the same kind of mental yeah. training that you need to do to um get yourself uh but i don't think you you will ever get yourself mentally prepared unless you do mountaineering mm-hmm. so so base camp once that's done um like it's the final third like i think that's the time when uh, you know, things are going through your mind. Um, you're probably questioning why on earth you're here. You're probably questioning if you will make it out alive. Did, did such thoughts cross your mind? On specifically Everest or in general? Everest. Okay. So that thought of why am I here comes pretty early. <laughs> Upon landing. <laughs> Not landing because Saraha, the Nepalese people are an amazing people, incredible culture, and. Um, you, it's be- pretty beautiful getting up there, right? Okay. Like the the, uh, the base camp trek is one of my favorites and I'll probably do it again mm-hmm. in my life. I'll probably go back and do it again. Um, you don't feel it yet, but a month in, you miss, I missed walking on flat surfaces. Okay. I missed the sound of the flush <laughs> because you don't hear it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> You're in the wild. Um, I missed being able to wash my hair and mount and Everest is considered like luxury because you get people like helping you and you get you get a shower every 10 days you, okay. yeah that's incredible I, I was worried lucky. that it'll be 60 days straight without one uh, no my record and please mom I hope you don't see this is on Denali it was 22 or 24 days of no shower at that point do you smell yourself <laughs> oh my god 
at that point okay wait before i get to that we were, ta- <laughs> we were talking about okay so before i talk about the smelly bits because it's a, a real true <clears throat> reality of mountaineering okay you get days where you're like what am i thinking when everything hurts and you're tired and you're hungry and everything you just think couch yeah i i never got to the point where i thought i regret being up there okay because i saw how hard it, it was for my mom and my dad to let me go up there and okay. my family yeah since you it was it wasn't easy what do you miss the most when you're up when you're up there like the, the small luxuries like like a like, like a penne nice, arabiata yeah no the, how that kid food food for food, sure i would imagine yeah but if, if, and then you when you're hungry you'll eat anything right mm-hmm. so that 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 kind of leaves after um three, four weeks, what you truly, truly, truly miss is the sense of being able to walk and ha- go, go, go to the bathroom comfortably. Or, normal, you normal, know, normal Like seat. showering without worrying that my hand will freeze <clears throat> in my hair, which happens. Wow. The things we take for granted. Yes, so when you're taking a shower and then the cloud comes and blocks the sun and then you get, you know, the water freezing and then you yeah. have to run out. <laughs> like with your wet with your pants and you with your jacket and go to the team tent and defrost your head so these small things are incredible because they're part of mountaineering but you take them for granted you lose it once you're out there uh, but i kind of like in the same way feeling that way feeling like you are a nomad and and just Mm -hmm. living minimal right um but yeah and then uh, uh, other stuff that i thought initially were difficult for me to let go were very easy i didn't it didn't bother me that I didn't, I didn't have my phone. Mm-hmm. It didn't bother me that I couldn't call. Is there a part of the mountain uh, that was like so challenging that you didn't think you're gonna get across? Like I've seen some videos of you, Raha, where like you had to walk across a ladder uh, in the middle of like a plateau. And uh, I, it, the it, Kumbu Icefall. It's yeah, it stayed with me that image. Yeah. It's called the Kumbu Icefall. So what is it? How do you guys set up? You throw a ladder across? Yeah, so the Kumbu Icefall is... It even sounds scary. Yeah, and I love the name, the Kumbu Icefall. It's amazing. Um, It's the classical way, because there are other ways of getting up Everest, right? But the Kumbu Icefall is the classical way of crossing it to get to the, uh, the, what they call the bottom of uh, the Lhotse face. Is the North Face Everest? Of course, but it's not the side that I went on. Okay, the north yeah. face is the 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 Tibetan side, okay. the Chinese. You Tibetan. asked for the harder route. No, that there's no such thing as the more difficult and harder. The Nepalese side is the one that has the more support. Okay. So I chose that as opposed to the north side that has less support. For my parents' sake, and just because <laughs> I also I also wanted to go through the side that has more support. Correct. So. Yeah. You, you, the Kumbu Icefall, they call it the gate of Everest because that's where you have to, f- the first monster you need to, you know, look in the eye. Call me crazy, it's my favorite part of the mountain. It's my favorite part of the mountain. It, it's like being in an actual Super Mario game. I felt like Super Mario. Uh, the, the ice doctors who are specialist Sherpas and specialist uh, Sherpas who are the people who live in ever. Uh, above a certain level in Nepal. They're mm. called the Sherpas. Sure, yeah. It's a tribe. Mm. The Sherpa doctors or the ice doctors, the ice doctors who are Sherpa, excuse me, are the ones that set up these ladders for people to cross. And they are hair raising. Like they, 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 like they, lay, it, they lay one across, it doesn't fit. They tie two together and then they, lay, they throw and then they throw them and then they're like a, there's like a dip. <laughs> and they're squeaky and they are like wobbly and you have to cross them with your 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 boots and your your crampons so you have teeth in the bottom of I, I don't even know where to go <laughs> you have teeth in the bottom of them my hands are not my hands are like getting tingly and they're like tiny metal mm. you saw the videos i saw the so, video but Mo i didn't finish it Mo is I obviously it. like t- tiny metal um rods that yeah. you need to slowly ch- ch- and i've seen people well you attach yourself in case you fall i've seen people fall but they didn't fall to their death, thank God, because they were attached. Okay. But it's a very long... There's no safety net on this. There's no safety net. And people have lost their I, lives on this? Yes, I've seen... Uh, I've seen Kombucha that. Kombucha rich. <laughs> Kombucha. <laughs> kumbu it's a spot. death trap. Yeah, and it's... Inc- I loved the kumbu. And then I... It was just like a... Again, a video game for me. I loved it. I and think I was it takes someone from... to love it uh, to do the seven summits. Yeah. Like if you're crazy enough I to do that, I enjoyed the kumbu. You're gonna enjoy the kombucha. And the kombucha. 
that's a dream. <laughs> and then in the beginning, you so the first time you go through the kumbu, it takes you ten hours. Oh wow! First time. Not I thought it was like an hour's gig. Mm-mm. First time it takes you ten hours to set up to. I mean, it took us first time. Well, okay. because <clears throat> you you're not used to it. You you're, you're yeah. trying to gauge, but. But trust me, by the fourth or sixth run, it took me like four hours. Oh my Because I was just like, okay, here is this falling thing, here is that, that, and let's go. But do not take it for granted because the same Kumbu ice fall that I climbed killed, I think, 17 or 18 people a year or two after I was there in a matter of minutes. There was a huge slab that came down and crushed these uh, the, the Sherpa doctors because okay. they were setting up the, the yeah. thing. But it's the mo- one of the most important parts of Everest is to train to cross the Kumbu. That's the hard. That's the hardest. No, part. it wasn't. It wasn't the hardest. It's maybe the most technical part. Okay. Uh, having passed the uh, the Kumbu. The Kumbu. Uh, it's such a cool name. Ridge or whatever Kumbu. it's called. Um, it's uh, it, it's it's not like the hardest is is, is out the way. I, I liked it. Uh, I really enjoyed it. A lot of people don't like it. A lot of people say it's the most difficult. Okay. I I mm, I liked it. At what point are you like? cliffhanging where your 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 stomach is pressed across the mountain and you're you're literally climbing your way so up. So Everest is considered to be a non-technical mountain, a, a light technical mountain. Okay. Because you don't actually ice climb it. You have an ice axe and they teach you ice drills like a self uh, resting which is basically when you fall how do you pull your ice axe out and self rest mm. on the mountain okay. so that you don't die and you don't fall to your death or pull to your team are you into the movies uh these these cliffhanger movies yeah, of these course, mountain I've seen movies. Them all, yeah. you saw cliffhanger the one of course was, uh, i saw cliffhanger i saw uh see everest? vertical limit i oh, saw right. everest in the cinema with all my friends okay and everybody was like she climbed it it was such a cute and embarrassing moment for me yeah, but yeah, yeah um i've actually met people that are part of that story mm-hmm. real people there no way. yeah that they were actually telling me the story yeah. um you you get up so you finish ice fall the combo ice fall you get to what they call camp one mm. so camp one is basically situated on top of the combo Sometimes you touch camp one and then go back down to base. Sometimes you sleep in camp one. It's part of the acclimatization. After camp one, uh, you go through something called the Western Comb, which is to me like a valley. It, it was like a microwave. It, because you're, it was snow and then the mountains were snowy and then the sun was hitting you from all angles. Mm-hmm. So it, if the wind was not moving, it's hot. Mm-hmm. And I saw so many pe- poor people that aren't used to the heat. <laughs> Haram, have a hard time. I was okay. You were loving it. I was, I was chilling. <laughs> um, but it's still difficult because you overheat and overheating makes you slow. And if you're slow, you exer- exert, yeah, you, you exhaust. Yeah. Yeah. Um, heat, the sun kicks your butt. Mm-hmm. This, you know, Are you sweating under all the gear yeah, when you're, when you're you, climbing? But you, you should not sweat under your gear. You should always temperature control. Okay. You should not be dripping inside your gear that means you're overheating yeah i get that a few times in skiing you I'm need sweating. to vent okay you need to learn how to vent yeah and uh from i was very lucky yeah vent i was very lucky i was never the type that overheats mm-hmm. but if i did it was usually my head because of my hair yeah <laughs> the fro it, it, you know, it's naturally <laughs> insulated so i was i was wearing a hat and hair yeah you know i would i would you know sweat from my head because mm. it was just so hot but um the kumbu and then after the Kumbu, you go Western Kum, Western Kum, you get to Lower Camp 3, and then you go through the Lotsi phase. Is that the, so, the home stretch so until you get to the... Not home stretch, I would say quarterfinals. Okay, oh my god. So the quarterfinals is the, the, the Lotsi phase, and it's a steep, very steep, long, very long uh, stretch mm-hmm. of ice. That can be really tough. And the day I went up, like, because you do it training, you go up half and come down. Mm-hmm. The day I went up completely, it was windy and I felt like there were shards of glass cutting my face. Nothing is showing. No skin is exposed. Uh, I don't. I wear a, uh, what they call a balaclava okay. or a buff yeah. and goggles because I need my face. Not so for sure. <laughs> there are some people that get lazy yeah. and they get burned. The triangle gets burned. So they put the balaclava the goggles and then they forget this i was like you covered it all huh yeah smart no you probably want to do that kill me yeah Yeah. well i'm lucky i only had frostbite once we can talk about that later 
It was completely my fault. I was lazy. Mm. Uh, yeah. Just a gust of cold wind. Oh, no, I'll, I'll explain to you because it was... The, I, we'll, uh, we'll get into that. Okay, I so deserved it. Going up the quarterfinals. Uh, I heard a rumor, and I don't know if it's true, and I know, probably no better person to answer this than you. Uh, is it true that um, they leave the dead behind? <laughs> How did I know I was going to ask this? Because you know I'm like... You know. Okay, so after you get through the Western Coombe, Camp 2, lower... Uh, sorry, Camp 3, lower... Uh, uh, and then higher Camp 3 is above uh, or halfway through Lotsi Face. Lotsi Face, you spend a night or two, depends on your strength. And then after the Lotsi Face, you go on to something called the, the Yellow Belt. Okay. That was uncomfortable. Why? It was snow and ice, and I don't like the sound of uh, the crack. Slushy, yeah, okay. La, la, yeah. El, el, la, like in school, when the teacher used the to... Nails on the chalkboard. Nail cho- so yeah. it's, your, your, your crampons are like... Yeah. Oh, and then you're sliding. Grip, no grip? No grip, because it's, it's rock. Well, that's a disaster. Disaster. Yeah. Um, I've seen someone actually fall and nearly like puncture someone else's chest. Uh, because you sh- you're supposed to control your feet because okay. that's one of the most... So someone cool. slipped and, and his... Yeah, thank God, because th- for those who haven't climbed, the two front part of the... Uh, the the uh, um, Your carabiner... Uh, not carabiner, oh my God. Your uh, crampons are really long. They're like this long. It's a funny name, crampons. Cramp, because they, they cramp on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Car- carabiner is a funnier one. <laughs> Carabiner or carabiner, so that is that can puncture you. That can really. Someone that, slipped and, it, and yeah, it, and, and it luckily, luckily someone. it didn't hit oh the person. God. Yeah, but that guy broke his fall by grabbing the rope while he was falling, and yeah. he had a gash of burn. Like, yeah, it was painful. It was either that or he didn't finish. He didn't summit. Someone. He had to. Yeah, because he was falling and he grabbed yeah. it, and he was gonna take three people out with him. So he he did that, and he he had to give up his no gloves. Gloves, but you're going down so fast, and the angle and is so And that was steep. it for him. He called it a day. Yeah, because you can. You he called can, it a month. Yeah, I think he. I think he didn't summit. I didn't see him after that. Anyway, so you get to the 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 um, yellow belt, mm-hmm. which is like this rocky, beautiful. I have a picture. I'll show you later. Actually, you've seen it. Yellow belt, and then the Geneva spur. It's the two names are that for the same thing, just different areas of yeah. the same. Yeah. So yellow belt, and then the Geneva spur, and then. As soon as you get to the Geneva spur, it, it plateaus. Are we at the semi-finals now? Semi-finals. I would, I would say semi. And I didn't even, I didn't even start from 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 uh, Lukla. <laughs> I didn't even. St- Lukla is the air, the the second most dangerous airport in the world. <laughs> so I didn't even start from Lukla. Luk- is that is that below uh, base camp? Yeah, it's below base below camp. camp. So you land in Lukla and you have to hike from Lukla to. Uh, Namche Bazaar and Namche Bazaar base camp that takes eight days it's a country ever yeah I'm like home. yeah it is and when people when people like m- think it's a walk in the park I'm like research it's, it's who in their right so mind so many people think it takes a week I'm like it, it doesn't even take a week to get to Lukla which is uh, sorry from Lukla to, to Namche Namche is the beautiful bazaar what, amazing place as well it's yeah. a beautiful bazaar where people trade all of these amazing things. Anyways, amazing. so you get yeah, to you get to yeah you plateau. You get to the death zone. <clears throat> the death zone. Yeah, where uh, you where you uh, see bodies. Per- perfectly named, <laughs> the the death zone because literally as you sit in the death zone, you are dying rapidly. We are not meant to function. Are we at twenty six thousand feet? You deal with feet. I don't deal with feet. I'm really bad. Seven thousand. You know what got me. Uh, the fact that Everest is pretty much at the same height of a cruising altitude of a seven of a seven for seven. Yeah, yeah. yeah. twenty nine thousand. I think feet. it's fourteen Burj Khalifas. Okay. Something like that. Um, yeah. So seven so, thousand. So I'm something. I'm 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 guessing you're at twenty six Let, meters is seven thousand nine hundred. Can you please check how how? Uh, what did I call him last night? <laughs> can you can you double check? Make these? believe, Jonathan. Yeah. Can you check the? Jonathan. <laughs> I think it was. Can you check how high uh, the death zone is? I would say seven something. Seven thousand Seven thousand yeah. something. Yeah. That's the only yeah. The summit is eight thousand. So I'm actually Jonathan. The um, summit is eight thousand eight hundred forty eight, I think. Death zone Everest is at eight. The, the the point is generally tagged at eight thousand meters. You can you can say eight thousand because there are multiple like yeah, camps. Yeah, yeah. We were at seven thousand. I remember this because I have a picture of myself with the uh, altimeter. Okay. It said seven. And change. Kaka. 
in meters, it's eight. So it's eight hundred, sorry, eight thousand eight hundred and forty-eight. Yeah. So it's the last eight hundred meters. Yeah. So it's basically the last leg of the tip of where the mountain is. Okay. So you get to the death zone. That's death zone. Yeah. It's called that because there are dead bodies there. A lot of people think it's called the death zone because the bodies are there. It is not true. It's called the death zone because you die rapidly sitting there. Because of altitude. Because of altitude. So then, why we don't they call the peak? Uh, the the peak must be the even deather zone. It's the graveyard. My God. Yeah, the highest grave, the highest graveyard in the world. So you get we 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 got put on oxygen from lower to mid camp three, right? Mm -hmm. So you train to put the oxygen mask and designers of the oxygen mask of Everest, please make some for Arab profiles. <laughs> <laughs> it was not for an Arab nose. It was like. Was it uncomfortable? It was bruising me. Ouch. It was. I have a small face, so it curved. Okay. The mask came and curved because if you have a wider face, it will spread out. It it won't, you know, bother you. It bothered me. How long did you have to tolerate this thing? Hours. For? But you nothing. have to sleep in it. There's you nothing worse than having uncom an uncomfortable gear to put to up with. You have to sleep in it. You have to actually sit in tent and sleep in okay. it. Okay. And I, I I was putting padding. I was cutting padding from my mat, <laughs> from my sleeping mat, and sticking it. <laughs> Because it was, it was hurting me. It was. That was quite creative of you. You. Uh, uh, I can be very creative. Attached to your creative yeah, side I can be has, very and I was has like, bailed you out. You know, really like freezing in the death zone, cutting the thing yeah. on and like sticking it. Because it was, it was uncomfortable. And then you wear it at night. You wear it for like twelve hours or whatever. Anyways. Cold factor. Cold being a factor at this point. Freezing. No matter what you wear. Freezing. No fire. No nothing. No, we have. Because of a lack of O2s, uh, gas gets uh, depleted very quickly. Okay. So in order, in order for you to boil water at altitude, it takes you, I don't know, quadruple the amount of uh, fuel than sea level. So what are you eating if you're not boiling water? So by the time you get, well, base camp is different. Each camp has a different system of food. Mm. I, we don't have time for to get into that. By the time you get to the death zone, you literally eat like out of uh, out of a, ba a bag a baggie that they open, put in hot water, and you just go. Boop, 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 like and it you, tastes better than you, anything you've ever had. But you're you're so. Everything is on low. Mm. I found a video of myself sending a video to my mom and dad that I don't even recall, you know. The one at the peak. Yeah, not a, in in the death zone before we did on the summit night. I I took the camera and I okay. was saying. Hi, mama. Hi, dad. And I, as you can see, I speak really fast. I was like, hi, mama. Hi, mama. And I thought I was, I thought I was fine. So you felt the lack of oxygen. You feel it. You're slow. You're sluggish. sluggish yeah. And it, everything is heavy. And then the gear. And then I was, I, in my mind, I was imagining the tent blowing off because there was a rip that started to rip from the tent. Okay. And I was in full fighting gear. I got to the I, the same clothes I wore and from the camp three. I was wearing for like four or five days. I was wearing the whole thing minus my thick boots. I had the liner boots on, mm -hmm. liner gloves on. I I was paranoid. I had gloves in my in my person. I had gloves in my summit suit. Yeah. I had gloves in my backpack. I had gloves everywhere because <laughs> I was worried one would fly off. And I was in my sleeping bag, like, you know. Yeah, just trying Let, to stabilize let's go. the thing. You know, I was in my sleeping yeah. bag. I was was there any worry that the tent would fly? Yes, or? because we have limited amount of tents. So, for example, if it flew off, me and the person that was in my tent would go with other people. So we're three, not okay, two. Yeah. But if that flew off, what do you do? You can't be four or five yeah. people in the tent. Yeah. Anyway, so I was like <laughs> fighting gear, waiting for them to call the summit call, the summit push. Mm -hmm. um, How long are you waiting there for? Uh, it feels days? like it felt like an eternity. It felt, but it's it was. A matter of hours. It was a. It was a. It was a like a day, half a day. It wasn't long. I can't tell you. Time is weird up yeah. there. I can't. Give, no reference. No, because I was just. It's constantly like, daytime, isn't it? Yeah. No. No. Do you see Ant Antarctica is constantly daytime uh, when you climb. Okay. It. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Everest, yeah. no, you get it. You get a night, but you're so hyped, and exhausted, and emotional, and charged. So I was just like. Yeah. Okay, on okay, edge. Okay. Um. Eight. What, one weird thing. I eat a lot when I'm climbing. I don't eat much in my real life, but I eat a lot when I'm climbing. But, but of course, I mean, I think you it's the cold. I think it's not only that, but how much are you burning? I know, but I ate more than even the guys. It was weird. Mm. I actually won the eating it's, competition in Antarctica. Is it stress eating? No, I think I was just constantly cold. 
Okay. I was con- I, uh, my body temperature was never stable. So food, you 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 get a sense of warmth when you eat. Yeah. Okay, so that explains. And that. then f- it's one way for you to fight the cold. And then fall asleep. Yeah. You subconsciously fought the cold by eating. Eating, and then I just f- yeah. you know eat. Anyways, yeah. uh, sitting down, waiting for you know you know summit summit. We we don't know when the summit called because the team tent is not us. We have a team tent. May you know main guys mm. may take the decision. Sherpas wake wake you. Sherpa came, you know, sh- tent shake. He shake the tent. I had an amazing Sherpa who I, I called him my shadow because he was with me the entire two months. Um, wow. his, his name was Ang Nurbu. Uh, Ang Nurbu. He was your best friend. Yeah, I he was think. my shadow. Yeah. I, I called him Noodles for the longest time because I couldn't say Ang I couldn't say Ang Nurbu. Yeah, um, it's tricky. Yeah, he was the same height as me, maybe a little bit shorter, but mm-hmm. man, was this guy incredibly fit. So I owe my summit to him. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. He came up to me and he said, Didi! Didi means sister in the police. Summit, summit! Didi! Okay, summit. I was like, okay, summit. He literally, you know, I opened the sleeping bag. Uh, again, another very interesting thing a lot of people don't know. Out of respect on uh, Mother Mountain, because it's, it's, it's uh, sacred for the Nepalese people, uh, non-married couples shouldn't be in the same tent. So out of respect, my Sherpa would never step in he would just open the tent and check up on me so out of respect uh he would be like okay did he summit now okay let's go so i i stuck my my feet out and he was checking my feet in the tent and i was putting on my gear it was like the movies and mm. putting on my gear checking everything he checked my feet i put the, you know he's like okay Didi, let's go you know he was in, an incredible how did you feel i mean you must have been like pumping like you charged like you've never been yeah charged and just you, is it is this happening? Is, is this happening? really happening? Yeah, oh yeah. my god! Oh, we're on. It's just we're like, on. <laughs> and everybody's everybody. You can see all you can see is headlights. Like okay. people just dark at this point. It's dark. Yeah. So you have to always climb, um, uh, bef- way be- uh, at the middle of the night when the weather is stable, okay. because the weather is stable when the temperatures don't change, right. right? So when the sun comes up, temperature changes. Wind is the enemy. Uh, wind is the enemy uh, and a blowout if you get a snowstorm mm. um, and altitude is the enemy as okay. well at that point um, okay Didi let's go everybody's like everyone's moving everyone's putting on gear okay let's go let's go Garrett uh, team lead team uh, the head uh, guy is like okay you on this rope you on this rope and he was putting everyone together you literally have no time to panic like you had to if they think if he looks at you and feels that you, there's something off. You're you're being. He'll call it. He'll call it. In mountaineering terms, they say they'll take your boots. Okay. So they because there's some people attempt. Yeah. So for example, if the head guy tells him you can't climb, he puts the boot on and climbs anyway. So they say they take mm-hmm. your boots. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if he feels that you have to be like on it out of protection for you I'm and everybody on the happy mountain, to hear, yeah, yeah so many people have died on the mountain, so yeah. Yeah, let's go, let's go, and gear on everything, and then you start climbing. He looked at you and you looked ready. Yeah, he came up to me and he was just like, you know, you're good, you're good, you're good, everything's good. Uh, you can see, you can clearly see fatigues and uh, hmm. it, on people's faces because it's just raw, raw. You know, you've been climbing for uh, a month, <laughs> to a month, uh, sorry, two months, so you're. You can see it mm. if someone has it or doesn't. He cut people already before that. Oh, he did. Oh yeah, he cut. So people. no one's safe. Yeah, yeah. Really. he cut people before we got there. Yeah. And this is what a good guide is. Yeah. Is you need to know. Anyway, we get there, uh, we get to the line, and then we start uh, climbing Everest. And I and it was a full moon. That night was a full moon, and I'll let, Mo, I'll never forget this. It was a full moon. And I usually have a, a, a habit of not looking up. I have a habit of not looking at the altimeter or the watch when I'm climbing or up because I don't like to get... Condescended. Yeah. I don't like to get like overwhelmed. Yeah. But it was Everest. Did so you look? I, I did. So I looked up. Can you share? It was this, the most surreal thing I've ever seen. What the hell did you see? 